topic I want to talk about is, uh, well, I mean, for probabilists, I would say random walks in random environments. For, uh, for analysts, I would say stochastic homogenization. And the focus here, and I, I try to be a little bit more precise in, uh, uh, in the sequel, is uh, uh, about quantitative statements. That's really uh, kind of, I guess, somewhat different type of questions that have been asked in the uh, probability community which is more kind of qualitative. But uh, uh, these types of questions are motivated by actual applications of uh, stochastic homogenization. So uh, this is work uh, which, um, uh, which uh, a while ago, about five years ago, uh, uh, Antoine Gloria, who was postdoc then with me, and I started. And by now, a couple of people uh, have, have joined it. So uh, um, let me uh, let me give you uh, let me start with a very brief overview of what I want to uh, what I want to talk about. So and then and then I introduce the setting so that uh, the presentation is clear. So uh, so if you want, uh, it's about uh, random walks in random environments. So I, I guess a very classical subject for uh, for this audience. And uh, but the uh, the types of questions we're asking. In, in this stochastic homogenization are quantitative questions. And uh, um, I could have formulated these questions in terms of PDE questions and you know, mechanics questions. And, uh, but, uh, but I don't do that here. And I would like to kind of present the part of the work which, uh, which comes in the language which, uh, uh, which uh, I guess uh, uh, this community is, uh, is used to. So. Uh, uh, so, in particular, I will uh, talk about the, uh, uh, an object which is called the corrector or the harmonic coordinates, which uh, I think many of you, uh, uh, all of you, have uh, treated uh, kind of random, random walks and random environments are familiar with, but I, I will explain it. And, uh, and it one, one outcome of what we did is, for instance, that in dimensions strictly larger than two, uh, a stationary corrector exists, which uh, I think was previously not known, and more recently we've identified the covariance structure of this object, which uh, uh, which I want to explain. Then, uh, so so this is uh, I think this is one object where what we did connects to uh, uh, connects to this community. Uh, the uh, the other object is uh, is a process uh, 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 which is uh, which is also I guess well known for many of you, which is. Uh, uh, if, uh, if I'm sitting on top of kind of uh, the random walker in this random environment, uh, then I can consider, uh, I can look at the environment which is around me and I can consider that process, so it's a, it's a stochastic, it's a Markov process on the, on the space of possible environments, so it sometimes goes by the name as the environment viewed from the particle, and you can ask, uh, so uh, uh, that process is well known to be ergodic, but, uh, but again, you can ask for a quantification of this, so you can ask the question, I mean, which, I mean can you quantify the ergodicity of this, uh, this process? So in a certain sense, everything is about making things which uh, you are well, uh, uh, many of you uh, will, will know quite well, making these things more quantitative. And, uh, and in, in, um, so one reason why I would like to present this uh, is that I think that uh, in, uh, in um, kind of trying to make these things more quantitative, we came up with, uh, or we further developed, a certain type of calculus which potentially might be interesting in uh, kind of more, uh, in situations which are a bit more on the frontier for, for this community. And kind of essentially the, the, two, uh, the two main ingredients from, uh, uh, for this calculus are on the one hand uh, a spectral gap inequality for the Glauber dynamics, I will explain uh, what that is, and uh, uh, essentially we're combining these with, uh, in the end, fairly standard partial differential uh, estimates, a priori estimates, and partial differential equations, and elliptic partial differential equations. So, so those are the two ingredients we really need to build uh, uh, to build the uh, to build the theory or to build the calculus. So, uh, so that's the rough, uh, rough overview of what I want to, uh, what I want to talk about. So now let me, uh, uh, let me kind of uh, explain my notation. Again, I'm an analyst, so my notation 
it's absolutely standard what I'm going to introduce, but uh, my notation <coughs> might, my language might be slightly different than yours, so perhaps it's worthwhile uh, doing this. But again, for those uh, who know about random walks and random environments, there's nothing special here. So uh, of course we're working with the lattice uh, Z D. Uh, the d-dimensional integer lattice, uh, x, y's are the points, the bonds or edges are called eb. And then, uh, uh, since I wanted to do calculus on it, I, I, I better introduce uh, 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 the notion of gradient uh, and the notion of a negative divergence. And, uh, but that's very much like uh, 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 absolutely standard. So, uh, so you think of, quote unquote, a scalar field. So that's something which lives on the vertices. And from this, you get a gradient field, which is a vector field, so something which lives on the edges, just by taking finite differences. And the negative divergence is just the L2 joint operator for this operator. So in a certain sense, it takes a vector field as ingredient, as, as input, so something which lives on, uh, on the edges, and gives a scalar field as an output, something which lives on the vertices, and it just measures how much flows in and how much flows out. So, uh, so I think that's... Uh, Nothing surprising, and once uh, 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 once you have uh, once you have this discrete calculus, you can introduce a coefficient field, or if you want jump rates for the uh, for the random walker, and uh, so in such sense, to every bond b, you attach a number a of b, and here we're we'll always be concerned with what's called the uniform elliptic case. So these uh, conductances are bounded away from zero and infinity. And without loss of generality, I can set the upper bound equal to one, and uh, and this lower positive lower bound lambda is fixed once once for all through the top. And now uh, now with this uh, with this object, I have a what I would call an elliptic operator. So an operator that maps scalar fields on scalar fields just by first taking the gradient, then I get something which lives on edges, multiplying with these uh, with the coefficient field, still get something which lives on edges and then taking the negative divergence, so that this is a non-negative operator, and I get back something which, is, uh, which lives on the vertices. And as many of you will know, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, despite the fact that this is discrete, it has a physical interpretation in the sense of a network of describing a network of resistors where these numbers A's are interpreted at the, uh, as the conductances, so 1 over A is the resistance uh, for the current across one of these bonds. And uh, uh, a scalar function can be assimilated with an electric potential that lives at the nodes. And, uh, uh, and that, uh, uh, by Ohm's law, kind of leads to current uh, across the edges, which is A times the gradient of U. And that current is stationary if the divergence or the negative divergence vanishes. So, uh, so that's one electrostatic uh, Interpretation, but then, uh, uh, then of course, as you're more familiar with uh, with uh, than I am, uh, there is also a kind of an elementary probabilistic interpretation that you can see this elliptic operator as being the generator of the random walk in this heterogeneous environment that's given by this coefficient field, and uh, it's uh, reversible uh, with respect to the uniform uh, distribution, and it's time continuous. So that's. Uh, that's perhaps the, uh, the, the point of view that's more uh, appropriate for, uh, for this audience. And, uh, and now, and now uh, uh, one introduces randomness in the, uh, uh, in the usual way, in the sense that uh, um, uh, uh, this, uh, this field of coefficients is, uh, is a random variable. And I denote these brackets, I mean, these pointed brackets here uh, uh, denote the expected value, or if you want the ensemble, the probability measure. On the, uh, on the space of coefficient fields. And the simplest setting, of course, and what I'm saying actually is already non-trivial and, and uh, for the most part new in the simplest setting, namely when we have IID coefficients, so meaning that these uh, conductivities are identically distributed independent from point to point. But, uh, uh, but the qualitative theory uh, 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 holds in a much more general setting, and in order to describe the general setting, uh, one needs to uh, uh, note that uh, the translation, the discrete translation group, acts on the space of coefficients just by shifting the coefficients without shifting the microphone. And uh, and uh, and the two uh, the two cru crucial properties 
um, uh, which, uh, which, which are kind of the main ingredients for the qualitative theory, is that, the, uh, uh, that this random field is, uh, that the statistics of the random field are shift invariant, meaning that uh, the random variable which is given by the original field and the random variable, infinite dimensional random variable which is given by the shifted field have the same distribution. And then ergodicity, which roughly speak means that, uh, uh, you, I mean, your coefficient field decorrelates over long distances. So that's, uh, uh, that's of course, trivially satisfied for the simple example. But uh, you need much less independence. You just need independence over very long distances. And one uh, compact way is to, uh, 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 to say that shift invariant random variables are almost truly constant, which is what's stated there. Okay. And then uh, many of you, uh, many of you will know that uh, that exactly these um, kind of uh, uh, these two conditions, stationarity and um, ergodicity, are enough to uh, kind of get uh, an invariance principle or quenched invariance principle, even uh, which I would denote by qualitative homogenization. So, in other words, uh, if these two conditions are satisfied. Uh, and you look at uh, you look at the random walk on this in this uh, kind of random heterogeneous environment. You rescale it in the diffusive way. Then it converges in law to uh, tra trajectory of Brownian motion with a covariance matrix that's given by the homogenized coefficient, which is a deterministic coefficient. And this is true pathwise if you want for uh, for or in other words for almost every realization of the uh, of the random coefficient field. And that type of result uh, kind of goes back to kind of independent work in East and West uh, uh, from uh, uh, almost uh, 35 or 35 years ago, uh, which uh, was first formulated more in a PDE context and not as sharply. And kind of this, uh, to my knowledge, this kind of quenched invariance principle in this uh, in this pleasing probabilistic form really is somewhat more recent and goes back to the work by. Uh, Ladas and uh, uh, Solis Snitma. Okay, so this is uh, this is just a, a quick recap of uh, uh, of the qualitative homogenization, and uh, and now uh, let me let me come to uh, uh, let me come to to the subject of this work. I mean this of this talk, and uh, let me let me kind of say that it's really different. What uh, I think it's really a different kind of research direction than uh, kind of what would be more natural for this community. So my, my understanding is, uh, is what, uh, what the probability community is mostly doing is, okay, now we know, uh, uh, since 10 years, we know this quenched invariance principle uh, in the uh, kind of, let's say, uniformly elliptic case. So how far can we push this? And uh, for instance, one very natural way to push that uh, to borderline situations is to kind of give up uniform elliptic and ask: uh, uh, Is this true if we go on to a supercritical percolation cluster? And in fact, uh, in fact, it is true, and that is uh, uh, that that has been uh, kind of the content of the more recent work. So what I'm doing is not this. I'm really looking at this really standard situation, but I'm asking different questions. So in, in particular, I want to develop a more quantitative theory. And that, as I said in the beginning, really comes from the applications and from very specific applications. You want to understand the scaling of the homogenization error. You want to understand the error when you're making, when you're using kind of numerical methods to infer the uh, effect of the homogenized tensor uh, by what's called the representative volume element method. And these are very, very natural questions. And, uh, and surprisingly, uh, they're hard to answer. And, and that, was, uh, that was kind of what, uh, what started us uh, on this. And since these questions are natural, it's not surprising that uh, kind of people, uh, not so long after homogenization was introduced, stochastic homogenization was introduced, addressed this, and kind of the first, the first deep work uh, was also in the Soviet literature and uh, obtained some quanti uh, quantification, but uh, a suboptimal one. Then there was unpublished uh, uh, very, uh, uh, for us, very uh, inspiring work by Ali Nadaf and Tom Spencer. Uh, and we're drawing a lot from this work, and I mentioned that a little bit more. Uh, then uh, Nadaf went on uh, uh, and did uh, uh, similar work with, uh, with Joe Condon 
And, uh, and then there's also kind of a more recent paper by Jean-Christophe Moura, who was also inspiring for, uh, for what we did. And, uh, and the story goes, uh, goes on. I mean, very recently, there's a nice work by Scott Armstrong and Charlie Smart, which, uh, uh, which kind of develops uh, in a such a different approach to getting some of, answering some of these, these questions. So, so again, uh, this talk is not about uh, these types of questions. So we're, in, we're really looking at the standard situation that might be a bit exciting, uh, I mean, a bit, uh, a bit disappointing for you, but we're asking different questions. Okay, so uh, so let me um, let me come to uh, let me come to the first point to uh, to what's called the uh, uh, director a uh, corrector. So uh, and uh, and kind of uh, the question of whether a stationary corrector exists and uh, kind of what can we say about its covariance structure. So uh, so what's the uh, what's the corrector in uh, in stochastic homogenization? Um, in a certain sense, it's a way of finding the right coordinates. So, uh, and it's called a corrector because you do the following. You give yourself an affine function on your lattice, which is parameterized or given by some direction in space, psi. And now you want to, uh, you want to take this affine function and you want to correct it by hopefully a small function in such a way that you get an aharmonic function. That's, uh, so this is why it's called a corrector. But at the same time, you see that you could also call it harmonic coordinate coordinates because if you choose kind of the basis of these direction vectors, then hopefully this would give you kind of curvilinear coordinates for your space. And there is already a first problem. It's not so clear what boundary conditions to impose on this function at infinity. Uh, uh, kind of enforcing that these uh, functions stay bounded is clearly too strong in a kind of random environment. And, uh, and due to a recent resu result not yet published by, uh, by these authors, uh, uh, the right, even in kind of this general context, the right condition that ensures existence and uniqueness is kind of to assume sublinear growth. Okay, so uh, we'll come back to uh, how to really make sense of this in a second. So, uh, so why have been probabilists interested in kind of these, uh, 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 this, this corrector? Because, as I said, these harmonic coordinates, in a certain sense, provide coordinates in which the random walk is a martingale. So it's a very natural, it's a very natural, uh, uh, very natural tool uh, to analyze kind of the uh, uh, the large scale behavior of the uh, of the random walk. So uh, uh, so that's the corrector. Um, let's uh, let's get, get a little bit closer and let's try to be a bit more precise about the definition. So here again is uh, is what you want to do. You're given a correction. Uh, you're, di you're given a direction in space, and then in a certain sense, at least you would hope that for every realization of the coefficient field, uh, you want to find this function of space and of course also co co of coefficient field that solves this elliptic uh, elliptic equation. And uh, and if you were able to do that in a unique way, then kind of this object, which is an object which is a function of the coefficient field and space, would be stationary in the sense that uh, if you shift the coefficient field, you also shift the, uh, the corrector. That's stationarity in, in this sense. And that's a property which you would like your corrector to have. And uh, I guess until our work, it was not clear that whether this was kind of asking for too much. So, uh, so if you want to approach this question, uh, um, a nice uh, thing to do, and which is kind of quite uh, common in the literature, is to slightly regularize this problem by introducing what I would call a massive term, so one of the t phi t term, uh, which uh, kind of uh, takes away the long range, uh, uh, the long range difficulty. I mean, the large scale difficulties you have with the problem, and once you have, uh, uh, and, and this t, of course as you know better than I can be interpreted kind of as a time scale on which you kill, uh, kill the random walker. Uh, so the, therefore we use, uh, we use this letter T because it's time scale. So, uh, so as long as this time scale is finite, then indeed uh, for every realization of the coefficients, you get a unique bounded uh, solution of this equation. And therefore you get stationarity and uh, expected value zero for free. So, but then you, I mean, in a certain sense, you just transfer the problem and uh, the question you now want to ask, do I keep control of this object if I let this time scale t, if I let this parameter 
the small parameter which sits in front of the massive term go to zero. But if we manage to do that, then uh, this would be kind of a much stronger statement. I mean, having a stationary corrector is a much stronger statement than just having a, a, a corrector that grows sublinear. So, uh, 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 so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a natural, it's a natural question. And uh, uh, so, uh, so here comes our main, um, our main assumption. So, so as I said, we want to go beyond the qualitative theory, so we want to make quantitative statements, but then of course we have to re replace qualitative assumptions like ergodicity by quantitative assumptions. And uh, something we learned from this uh, unpublished or partial, I mean, there's one published and one un unpublished work by Nadav and Spencer, is that kind of the right, uh, a very convenient and good way of quantifying ergodicity <coughs> is to impose a spectral gap on this, uh, uh, on, this, uh, uh, on this ensemble of coefficient fields, meaning uh, that you have, uh, so as an analyst, I would say this type of Poincaré inequality. Uh, so for any random variables, you can estimate the variance by the expected value of the square gradient. Uh, and, you're, and the square gradient is really, you're asking how does this random variable depend, how sensitively does it depend on the conductivities at different edges. And it's called a spectral gap because it's, the, it, 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 it's related to the spectrum of the generator of the Glauber dynamics on, uh, uh, on the space of coefficient fields. And morally speaking, we know from many criteria, that uh, uh, this will be true if uh, correlations are integrable. So in a certain sense, this is, this is uh, really a quanti quanti I mean, quantifying ergodicity in the sense that you want decorrelation, your de decorrelation tails to be so thin that they're integral. So really fast decaying correlations in the sense. That's morally speaking equivalent to this condition. Okay, so, uh, so that's, our, uh, uh, that's our main, uh, main working horse uh, 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 from, in the sense, from probability theory or if you want statistical physics. So here comes the uh, here comes the result. Uh, so again, we're looking at this uh, uh, at this modified corrector. So we added this massive term so that we can make sense of the corrector uh, for any, no matter how small this uh, regularization parameter uh, is t. And now we're interested in kind of bounds on uh, on this object that are as much as possible uniform in p. And the result is that. Uh, uh, provided uh, uh, the, uh, the ensemble is stationary and it satisfies this quantified uh, ergodicity property in the sense that we have a spectral gap, then in dimensions larger than two, all moments of uh, the gradient and of the function itself are bounded. So in particular, uh, there is a, a stationary, I, this easily implies that I can let t go to zero, uh, infinity which means I do get, indeed, in dimensions larger than two, I do get the existence of a stationary corrector. And in uh, dimensions two, uh, uh, it's, uh, th that's a borderline situation in which while the gradient of the corrector stays bounded, uh, the, uh, the corrector itself uh, uh, kind of depends logarithmically with the right power here in terms of the moment on the, on the regularization parameter. And, uh, and for the experts, of course, this looks like uh, kind of the behavior of the Gaussian free field. And that's not so surprising because in a certain sense, this A, because of the spectral gap condition, um, uh, uh, has very short range uh, uh, correlations. So essentially, you could think of A as the IID. Uh, these short range correlations, in a certain sense, transmit to, uh, to this object, to the gradient, because these are locally multiplied with each other. Uh, that's not quite true in the linearization. There is a Helmholtz projection between them, but still that doesn't kind of destroy uh, the fact that, uh, uh, that still the, uh, the, cor I mean, the co uh, co uh, covariances of this object should decay nicely. And then of course you're integrating up ones going from the gradient to the function. And that, that as, as you know, is kind of critical in dimension two. So, uh, so it looks a little bit like, uh, uh, like uh, the behavior of the Gaussian free field, but in fact it's not quite. Uh, so that's, um, 
That's the, uh, uh, the more recent result with uh, Jean-Christophe Mourat. So, uh, and that's not really surprising because uh, clearly this corrector uh, is a little bit less universal in the sense that it depends on this correct on this direction psi, which I uh, kind of uh, fixed in space. So, in a certain sense, the affine function, the direction in which I look, and that introduces an additional amount of anisotropy. And so uh, we just looked at kind of the simplest situation where in fact we have an IID ensemble and we're in kind of dimension larger than two. And then we can characterize the uh, large scale behavior of the uh, covariance function. And it's given uh, by an expression, uh, well, it's best to understand this, uh, this limiting behavior of the covariance function by looking at its Fourier transform. And uh, then you get an exact formula and, uh, and the expression is a rational function. You have, uh, uh, you have something quadratic in the numerator and something quartic in the denominator. It's non-negative. It has a scaling as if, it, as, it, as, if, as, as if you had kind of a, a Gaussian free field, but it's not of the form. It's not exactly of this algebraic form uh, which you have uh, for a Gaussian free field. And that's, again, not surprising because the anisotropy which comes from this psi intervenes. Oh, by the way, how much? Okay, so uh, let me uh, uh, let me let me explain. Uh, oops. Let me explain. Let me try to explain. Uh, so, so in some sense, all this information uh, about the uh, about the covariance structure resides in this uh, four linear form, which has which is not completely symmetric, but has some symmetries. And let me, uh, let me explain uh, 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 how this one is given on, uh, let me try to do that on one slide. So, uh, so here again is kind of the Fourier transform of the asymptotic covariance. Uh, so uh, K is the wave vector, Psi is this fixed direction that defines the corrector. And, uh, and in the numerator you have this four linear form. So how is it defined? So it's a function, it's a four linear form on RD. It's a function of uh, kind of four uh, vectors in R D, and it's obtained by looking at this uh, uh, at this expected value, where uh, the arguments of the expected value come from solving the corrector equation for these four different directions: psi one, psi two, psi three, psi four. Then you look at kind of the current uh, which belongs to uh, to the corrector, so this quantity. Uh, then you look at uh, you look at the standard edges in your lattice e1 to ed. You take the expected value and then you sum. That would be the truth if it weren't for this uh, uh, operator l here, uh, which really comes from uh, which can be seen as as the helfer schoenstrand uh, representation of the uh, covariance structure of the underlying uh, of the underlying um, uh, um, uh, ensemble. So, uh, so that's the uh, that's the uh, that's the formula which you get. So you can read off kind of the symmetry properties here, and you see that uh, in a certain sense, not just the homogenized coefficient, but also the underlying probabilistic structure enters in the covariance structure. And actually, this formula is not at all mysterious. Uh, you use this uh, uh, you use this um, uh, this formula for uh, the covariance. And uh, uh, you use it for the corrector itself, which means you have to compute the, uh, if you want, the sensitivity of the corrector. How does the corrector at a point x in space depend on the conductivity at long an edge e? Not surprisingly, that brings in the Green's function, and again, kind of the, uh, the flux which uh, comes with the corrector. And then uh, the only thing where you have to work is to use homogenization on the Green's function to say essentially. The, uh, the quench Green's function can be approximated by, uh, by the homogenized Green's function modulo the corrector. And uh, that's what you want to plug in. And if you, could, if you had an identity here, this formula would be exact. And you have to work uh, a bit to, uh, to prove that, uh, that the error is small enough so that the asymptotics is true. So, uh, 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 so, uh, so that's, uh, that's what's behind the uh, Behind the uh, behind the covariance structure of this corrector. Okay, so um, 
So that's the, uh, uh, that's the corrector. So in a certain sense, we get uh, under, if, if you want, optimal uh, assumptions on, uh, on decorrelation of the coefficient fields, we get optimal <coughs> statements on, uh, 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 on, on this corrector. And in particular, we get the existence of the stationary corrector. And uh, let me now kind of move on to, oops, to, uh, uh, to what, I said, uh, what I said before, namely that uh, uh, um, I want also to look next to the corrector, I want to look at something or show you our results on the other object, which uh, might be familiar to some of you, which is this process of the environment seen by the particle and its uh, ergodic properties. So, uh, so this is just a reminder for those who uh, who don't know, so uh, uh, so so you have this uh, you have this uh, this particle that forms a kind of a simple random walk in this heterogeneous environment, and now it's, uh, now you sit uh, you place yourself on top of the particle and you look at your changing environment, and that defines a process on the environments which is uh, which is called which usually goes by the name environment viewed from uh, from the particle. And, uh, and again, uh, if, you, if you want to quantify, and this is something uh, I learned from Jean-Christophe Moua, if you want to quantify quench invariance principles, in a certain sense, you have to quantify the ergodicity properties of this process. So uh, let's be a little bit more mathematically precise. So here is kind of the generator or the uh, forward equation that governs the random walk in a given environment A. Uh, it preserves stationarity of solutions, which means you can lift it onto uh, the level of stationary fields. Uh, uh, a bit, uh, probably I'm using the language uh, of Balin Tut now in the wrong way, uh, whether I'm lifting or in the right direction. So I'm, I'm lifting now from something which lives in physical space to something that's uh, 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 something that uh, just lives on configuration space because I'm looking at stationary fields. And then uh, and then this equation translates uh, one to one into uh, this uh, something a little bit less palpable equation that involves uh, uh, what, uh, what uh, I think I learned that from Stefan Ola that one should call these derivatives or horizontal <coughs> derivatives, which just come from uh, kind of shifting, uh, uh, shifting the random variable and looking at uh, this type of differences. So anyway, uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the way of writing the generator of, uh, of this uh, process of um, um, uh, the environment as seen by the particle. And now the very natural question again is, at what rate does this, uh, uh, I mean, what's the, what, what, how can you quantify ergodicity of this process? At what rate do random variables uh, converge to their uh, expected value under this, uh, under this evolution? And uh, um, and here here is uh, here is our result. So uh, again, uh, here is uh, here I wrote down the kind of the generator or the semi group or the equation that defines the semi group uh, uh, of this uh, process of the environment seen from the particle. And now uh, in homogenization, as the experts know, one is not really interested in general initial data, but one is interested in the initial data particular one's interested in what's called the local drift. So that means one's interested in initial data that can be written as the horizontal derivative of something, and something local. And, um, and so, uh, so that's, uh, that's the situation we, uh, uh, we consider here. And again, under the, same, uh, under the same assumptions as for the corrector, if the ensemble is stationary and if it satisfies the spectral gap, then we get the optimal decay in terms of all moments of, uh, uh, of the semi group with this algebraic rate, uh, uh, which uh, is as it should be, uh, and, uh, and this minus one half, that's the one you have to work for, which comes in a certain sense from this derivative. And also, you get a very concise way in which you measure the locality of this random variable. So, the drift uh, uh, for those, for the experts, if you use that for the local drift, this sum here just depends, I mean, this sum collapses to one entry. But uh, it also holds in a more general sense, and this uh, this norm here measures the uh, the locality of the uh, initial data. So, uh, um, if you want uh, uh, a kind of a more a more general point of view of this result, is 
that we made uh, we made a relation between uh, between the ergodicity properties of two different processes. One is uh, just the Glauber dynamics, which doesn't have to do anything with our kind of elliptic equation. I mean, it's just kind of uh, you change uh, you change the strength of the conductivities according to the Glauber dynamics. That typically has a spectral gap, or that's what we're assuming, and that's true in the IIB case. And on the other hand, you have the generator of this process environment viewed from the particle that does not have, uh, uh, typically does not have a spectral gap. But the idea of the previous result, in a certain sense, is to convert uh, the spectral information of this process uh, with its clear spectral gap to a spectral information on uh, uh, or semi-group decay of this process in the sense that you show that the spectrum has a thin bottom and therefore you get this, uh, this algebraic rate of convergence. So that's, uh, 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 that's, that's uh, kind of a, a more general point of view of this, uh, this result. So how much time? Five. Okay, so let me... Uh, okay, so, uh, so I guess I now kind of gave you Again, in completely standard situation for you guys, uh, the two quantitative results, um, uh, which are kind of closest to, uh, to the, the objects you're dealing with. I mean, for us, this was an intermediate step, and then we looked at uh, homogenization errors, at numerical schemes, and that kind of thing. But I don't want to talk th about this. Instead, I, I, I would like to uh, just give you a glimpse of uh, uh, of the, the, uh, this, this type of calculus we're using. And I want to do that because I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's neat and, uh, and perhaps it uh, uh, can be also used in a, in a different context. So again, uh, uh, the only, the, uh, in a certain sense, the only probabilistic ingredient is the spectral gap uh, uh, inequality. And then, uh, and then the rest relies on what I would think fairly elementary estimates for elliptic partial differential equation. So let's, uh, let's look at this result, uh, 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 kind of the moment bounds on the corrector. Here again is uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this assumption uh, on the spectral gap uh, we're making. And, uh, and I want in particular to look at the case uh, of two dimensions, which is in some sense the hardest, uh, the hardest case. So, uh, uh, so the moment bounds, uh, uh, you can split them into two statements. The first statement is tells you that the pth, two pth moments of the corrector are estimated by the two pth moments of the current. And then there is actually an easier argument where you can get go different routes, which tell you that all the two pth, all the moments of the current are bound. So, uh, so let me give you, let me give you, uh, let me show you the argument. Uh, of uh, how to bound the, uh, the moments of the corrector by the moments of the current. So, uh, so that's the difficult correction. I mean, the gradient, uh, 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 the gradient uh, even in the linearization, you see that the gradient, I mean, I mean only, the, uh, only the corrector itself has kind of this potential infrared, uh, infrared uh, divergence. So, uh, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's the interesting inequality. And uh, um, so, in fact, uh, uh, we have to look right away at higher moments instead of just looking, if, even if we were just interested in second moments, uh, uh, the proof requires looking at higher moments, which means we look, uh, we use uh, kind of an LP version of the spectral gap inequality, which is an easy corollary, which just uses the Leibniz rule for the carré duchamp operator here. And uh, so, uh, so that's what we want to use. So we want to use this here uh, for the corrector, let's say at the origin. And that means if we want to use that, what we have to understand is, well, how sensitively does the corrector depend on the coefficients? So it's kind of a sensitivity estimate. We want to uh, understand the Euclidean norm of this quantity, which is the corrector at the origin. How sensitively does it depend on the conductivity at nearby and far away edges? And of course, hopefully, it doesn't depend much on the conductivity of far away edges. So, um, so we're really looking for what I call a sensitivity estimate, which is a deter I mean, it's a deterministic estimate. And uh, and so I'm not going to go through the slide, but this slide really has all uh, all the details. 
the, the message of this slide is, um, in order to get, uh, to get a sensitivity estimate, all you need is an a priori estimate on a single elliptic PDE. Because if you're asking yourself, well, what's the infinitesimal variation of my corrector if I perturb the coefficients? So that's what I, want, what I need to answer if I want to compute this Fréchet derivative. I'm, 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 I'm uh, getting this equation. So uh, I, have to, I have to look at an a priori estimate uh, uh, for this equation. And, uh, and there is one, uh, a fairly standard one, which in two dimensions is subtle because you expect the subtleties there, uh, bringing in the logarithms and an exponential weight and an algebraic weight and an exponent which is slightly away from two. But uh, it's, uh, it's uh, essentially an estimate which can be taken from the shelf. And um, so with this estimate, here, here it is again. Uh, this estimate, one-to-one, -one, translates into a sensitivity estimate. So an esti in an est into an estimate of this quantity, so the, uh, uh, the infinite dimensional Euclidean norm of the gradient or the Fréchet derivative, if you want, of, uh, of the corrector at the origin <coughs> in terms uh, of the gradient of the corrector. So note this is still a completely deterministic estimate. There's nothing random at this stage. And now only, so, so in a sense, the entire proof is on this slide. We, uh, we need this PDE estimate. By duality, it converts into the sensitivity estimate. Now we take the expectation. So the expectation falls onto, uh, if we take the expectation on the left-hand side, this inequality, then the expectation falls onto uh, 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 the two pth moment of the gradient of the corrector on the right-hand side. There we use the one probabilistic ingredient, namely that we have stationarity. So once we take the expectation, this doesn't depend on the edge anymore, so we can pull it out. Uh, then this integral just gives you another logarithm. This is why you get logarithm to the power p, as you should. And then, as I said in the beginning, we're using the p version of the spectral gap, and there you get the, uh, the inequality. So, so the entire proof is really on this, uh, uh, on this line. That's, that's a little bit the message I want to uh, I want, to get I want to get through that with help of uh, a PDE estimate, which essentially you can, uh, can uh, take from the shelf, uh, it converts into a sensitivity estimate, which is something we PDE people are not so much used to thinking. And then with kind of these two ingredients, stationarity and quantified ergodicity, you get the estimate you want. Okay, so uh, that is, these two slides are the argument for uh, 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 for, the, for the second part of the bound, um, uh, which I don't go through, uh, that's a little bit more universal, and uh, in the recent work, Armstrong and Smart have found a different way, uh, variational argument for the same, uh, for the same type of thought. Okay, so, uh, so let me wrap up. So, uh, what I, so I try to, uh, uh, to present to you kind of just two elements of this um, uh, of this uh, work on uh, quantitative homogenization theory. We looked at the corrector and proved, uh, for instance, that uh, stationary corrector exists in dimension larger than two. Uh, we looked at this environment as viewed from the particle and quantified in an optimal way the ergodicity. And again, uh, I'd like to stress that it's really uh, kind of a nice functional analytic calculus that's just based on the spectral gap estimate and the uh, and, uh, and a little bit of elliptic theory. And, uh, but of course, uh, what, I would, what I would like to do in the future is kind of see that these tools also work in, uh, for the problems you might be more interested in. So for instance, uh, uh, the case of supercritical percolation, and, uh, and there we, uh, 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 we think, and we have done it for uh, a somewhat simplified model uh, as a preprint, that, for instance, the existence of a stationary corrector in dimensions strictly larger than two can also be, by the same type of methods, obtained, uh, obtained in, this, uh, in this more subtle situation. And then, of course, uh, uh, a much harder problem, which uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, I'm discussing occasionally with Scott Armstrong, is, uh, uh, and that, that is kind of the problem which uh, Barney Tot was considering, but in an even more difficult form when the drift he was considering is not divergence-free. So it's kind of these models a la um, Brickmont and Kupiain or uh, uh, Zaytouni and Snitman, 
so can we use kind of this set of functional analytic ideas to, for instance, construct the stationary measure, the non-trivial stationary measure in this situation? So that's something which I which I would like to do. <coughs>